I want to jump into our message today, and this is going to be a one-hit wonder. We're just going to do it this Sunday. It's not part of a series, and then I'm going to come back here in a couple weeks. We'll start a fresh new series, but right now, today, the title of our message is called The Church of the Ugly Duck. All right, The Church of the Ugly Duck. There's a duck that goes into a restaurant, and he orders a sandwich and fries and a Coke. The waitress says, I'll put the order in, but I want to know how you're going to pay for it. The duck says, put it on my bill. (laughs) Amen. The duck walks into a hardware store. Says to the owner, he says, hey, do you have any duck feed? The hardware store owner says, no, and we don't serve ducks. We don't like ducks. Get out of here. The next day... The same duck walks into the same hardware store, says to the same owner, says, hey, do you have any duck feed? Hardware owner says, I told you yesterday, we don't serve ducks, we don't like ducks, we don't have any duck feed, get out of here. Third day, same thing. Well, now the hardware store owner is just livid. He says, let me tell you something, duck, if you come in here one more time, I'm going to nail your little webbed feet to the floor. The next day comes. The duck walks in. He says to the hardware owner, the hardware owner is furious. He says, hey, do you have any nails? The hardware owner says, no, I don't have any nails. And the duck says, well, good. Then do you have any duck feed? (laughs) All right, the church of the ugly duck today. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. This is known in Scripture as the great hall of faith. And we're going to just read a couple of these heroes of our faith today. And then we're going to kind of compare them to our lives. Let's look, oh, down to verse 7, Hebrews chapter 11. And this is listing out some of our patriarchs and our heroes and some of their great accomplishments they made in their lifetime. For instance, by faith, verse 7, Noah, being divinely warned of things not seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark. For the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. Uh, And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs with him the same promise. Verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child. I tell you what, you want to make my wife mad, just say, hey, do you want to have another baby? <laughs> there are a lot of you that I think would make mad if we said that, right? But Sarah's, you know, she's, she's way up there in age, and she's, she's received supernatural strength to receive and have a pregnancy. Verse so. You know, we can keep going. Let's go down to verse 22. I go to verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of a staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel, gave instructions concerning his bones. Verse 22, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. Y'all ever see what's called a highlight reel? We take, for instance, an athlete over the course of a five-year career or a four-year career, and we take 30 seconds or we take one minute of their top 20 plays over those four or five years. And man, when you look at those plays, You think, man, this is a superstar. Of course, they edit out all the times they threw the ball away. They edit out all the times they ran the wrong way. They edit out all the times they didn't run the right play. Those, you got four years of stuff that doesn't get put in there. One minute of stuff makes the highlight reel, okay? All right. And in Hebrews chapter 11, this is the great hall of faith. This is is the highlight reel of a lot of these people's lives. We're showing what they did. The Bible is showing these people are heroes. 
And I agree with that. But sometimes when you're comparing yourself, and it's not wise to compare yourself, but when we do, and we look at, man, Abraham was this awesome, righteous man. Noah. I mean, can you imagine the foresight of Noah? It had never even rained. There, there was no such thing as an ark. And God says, build an ark because it's going to rain. And it's going to take a, about 100 years to do. And it's going to cost in today's equivalent over $100 million to build. Can, can you imagine? I mean, I, I, I felt, you know, we were out there a little bit, build the church this nice in a small town. We're out there a little bit. Sure we are. But you know what? That when God says go, you don't look to the sky. You look to the word. Amen. And Noah had a word. Go build it. And even though it had never rained, even though it never had been done, it was going to take a long time and a lot of money, he did it in obedience to God. Okay. But we look at that and we think, man, Noah's awesome. I can't even remember to set my clock forward. Or Noah's awesome. You know, I can't even get, I, we can't even go to church without fighting. I can't get my kids to get out of bed. I can't get my kids to, you know, not talk back. How, how, you know, those guys are all awesome. And I look at my life and I see all the junk in my life. I look in the spiritual mirror and I don't think I'm all that. Y'all, anybody here ever watched the movie called It's a Wonderful Life? And it is a very generational movie. I want, I want to speak to our young people just for a moment. Uh, if you've never watched It's a Wonderful Life, I know, it's, I know it's in black and white. You can actually get it in color now. But it's a great movie. Go back and watch it. Go back and watch It's a Wonderful Life. But one of the main characters in It's a Wonderful Life is Clarence, the angel. And if you remember, Clarence was an angel with no wings. He was a second-class angel because he'd never earned his wings. Now, this is not theologically correct. But nonetheless, you know what? There's a lot of Christians out there today that feel like you're a Christian second class. You feel like, you know what? I, I, I've got all this dirt on my life. I've never earned it. I've never done this. I've never done that. I, I just, I'm like Clarence the angel. I don't have my wings. I'm an angel, but second class. I'm a Christian, but second class. Now, I want to tell you a story about the ugly duckling. There was a mama duck, and she had several little eggs. And one day those eggs hatched. And out of those eggs, there were six beautiful little baby ducks. I'm, and guys, just so you know, I'm using all the faith I got not to talk right now about all the YouTube videos I like to watch where these pike and bass come up and just take the duck. Just zip it. That would, be my, that would be how I told the story, but this is not. But the last duck to be born did not look as beautiful as the other little baby ducks. And the other little baby ducks made fun of that duck, bullied that little duck, made that little duck feel inferior. As a matter of fact, that duck many would describe as ugly. And the baby duck went to its mommy and said, Mommy, Mommy, everybody's making fun of me. They're calling me ugly. It's just terrible. I look in the mirror and you're right. I'm ugly. And the mama duck said, You know, honey, one day you're going to grow up to be a beautiful swan. And you know the end of the story. There were some more making fun of. There were some more difficult times. But that little duckling, the ugly duckling, grew up to be a beautiful swan. And I want to invite you today to the church of the ugly duck, that we are a bunch of people who come together, maybe feeling at times like the ugly duckling in the faith. You don't pray enough. You don't read your Bible like you should. You've messed up. You've fallen a time or two. You started off on the right path and you got off. You've lost your cool and blown your witness. You've gone through a trial or a tribulation and you allowed doubt to creep in, unbelief or greatly discouraged you were. 
You've allowed a feeling of loneliness or abandonment to come in, and you've even questioned God. And then we read Hebrews chapter 11, and we see all the pretty ducks. We see Moses. I mean, when I think of the faith it took for Moses, he was a child of privilege. Growing up in Pharaoh's house, wealthy, all the riches of Egypt, the wealthiest nation on earth at that time were his. And he chose to go suffer affliction with his people than to enjoy that luxury of living like an Egyptian. We see they endured great sacrifice. It almost seems like if God had favorites, they would be it. And if we're not careful, sometimes we'll allow ourselves to pull out our violin and begin to play a sad song about our life. And woe is me, gloom and despair. Everybody hates me. Nobody likes me. I'm going to go eat worms. And I want to give you our keynote scripture today. It's Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you shall complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If I could just, if, if you ever want to get a tattoo, and I'm not saying you should, I don't have any. And, you know, I know people, well, bless God, tattoo, blah, blah. Look, man, if you're going to get one, get Philippians 1 6. He's going to complete in me what he started, praise God. Amen. That's what I'd tat on, you know, get a tat up, praise God. Get it right on your forehead, too. If you're going to do it, do it right. I mean, just go all in. But seriously, he who began a good work in you, being confident of this, is going to complete it. He's not done with you yet. You're not fully baked. Y'all ever, I mean, y'all ever bake a cake? Actually, they're doing this in kids' church this week. They're, they're talking about patience this, this month. And they're using a bakery theme. You don't want to pull a cake out of the oven before it's fully baked. You're not fully baked yet. You're not, you're not fully developed. You're not fully matured. You're not fully completed yet. You're a work in progress. And be confident that the Lord is going to complete it in you. I want to go back and I want to look at those beautiful ducks of Hebrews chapter 11. The ones that everybody said, ooh, in awe, and I wish I had faith like that. I want you to think about Noah, who, well, I mean, seriously, I, I still marvel at that faith. I, I mean, let me tell you something. This building project took us about a year and nine months, start to finish, plus the three years to raise the money. About a year and nine months, that was good for me. I'm done. Praise God. People say, Pastor, I just have this vision of, the church is full, and we have to build again, and this, that, and the other. I say, I rebuke you. <laughs> but not, I, I say that jokingly because I, 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 there's so many people that have had that vision. And uh, we just have to say, you know what, Lord? Be it unto me. Be it unto me. I'm not going to tell God no. I found out that doesn't go real well. But... The faith to build a building project for over 100 years and raise all that money, it's a big deal. Gets on the ark, taking care of animals for a year on that ark. Can you imagine how much manure was produced on that ark? Eight people, every species, times two or times seven, times 14 in some cases, and they had, that, they had to shovel that manure every day. Can you imagine? I mean, the cows alone. I used to shovel horse manure. Those things are capable. I've got just two dogs, 
That's, that's more than I ever want to see again in the rest of my life for in one week. <laughs> this great man of faith gets off the ark. He's, he is the man. Let's grow us a little garden here. Let's do, we're older now, let's do raised beds. I think, I think it's Genesis 9 somewhere. Let's plant us some grapes. I got an idea. Let's ferment the grapes. 500 years old, Noah. He's 500 years old. All right. They get to talking, and before long, they've drank a bottle, drank a second bottle. He's feeling really good. It's really good wine. Hitting down with Jeremiah the bullfrog. Let Noah drink his wine. Oh, man, there's times I make myself laugh right there. That's good, man. <laughs> Noah's, Noah, Noah's drinking with Jeremiah the bullfrog and getting drunk. I think he'd had so much he started seeing Jeremiah the bullfrog drinking with him. And then the next thing that happens, the Bible tells us, this is in the Bible, folks. I mean, you don't need to watch The Young and the Restless. You can get it right out of the book of Genesis. Noah just starts stripping down. And next thing we know, he's out there, woohoo, streaking, 500 year old man, woohoo! <laughs> then he goes into his tent and passes out. That's your hero right there. I know I've seen some signs, my hero wears scrubs. Yeah, my hero passed out drunk at 500 years old. You know, he was a beautiful swan, all right, but he was also an ugly duck. Abraham, man, the father of our faith. I mean, Abraham did some awesome things. You know, the Bible tells us right around Genesis 12 is where the story of Abraham picks up. Abraham was the descendant of Noah. He, uh, scholars, Jewish scholars believe that Noah was still alive when Abraham was being discipled, and Noah had a hand in discipling. Abraham, and uh, Noah, or Abraham, leaves his homeland. God says, get out of your country. Don't take anybody with you. Go to a land I'm going to show you. This is no Rand McNally, no Google Maps, no cell phone, no GPS. All you got is some camels in a tent. Take your family, go out into the vast expanse, leave everything you know behind, and I'm going to raise up and bless all nations of the earth through you. And all the, of course, you know Abraham's name. Abram was his original name, Abram, which means father. Abraham means father of nations. And so this whole time, you know, he's traveling all these lands and introduced himself. Hi, my name's father. Really? That's a cool name. How many kids do you have? I don't have any yet. And then God comes to him after several years and says, all right, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. I'm going to call you Father of Nations. And Abraham, boy, that's really cool. He goes, hey, everybody, my name is Father of Nations. Really, how many kids do you have? Well, none. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, for, for 20 years, that guy's going around, hi, my name is Father of Nations, you know, okay? He ain't got a single kid. <laughs> but you know, he stuck it in there, and he used his faith. And he ended up with Isaac, the child of promise. And you know what? Hero of our faith. But in that process of time, he did a lot of stupid things. God told him, don't take anybody. He took his nephew Lot. That turned out to be a disaster. God, <laughs> he gets scared. He goes into a foreign land. Here's the king of Imelech. Abraham looks at his wife. <laughs> There's just some things I still have yet to understand out of the scriptures. The story of Abraham and Sarah is one of them. They're just the messed up stuff here. This is, I don't even think this would make the days of, of our lives. A Abraham looks at King Abimelech. That's a mighty king right there. 
He looks at his wife. That's a pretty lady right there. At least he knew his wife was acknowledged his wife was pretty. That's good. But then he says, I don't want him to kill me because of her. King of Imlech, this is my sister. Have her. <laughs> Gives his wife to a king and calls her his sister. Folks, I've done taught marriage seminars for a long time. <laughs> and there is no instruction ever for a better marriage that says introduce your wife as your sister. <laughs> Just give your wife to another man. There's no, there's no place in scripture that that is okay. He, he's got this desire and this dream to be a father of nations that even God has acknowledged. But God is taking so long. And so they come up with this plan. And I don't know if you've ever come up with a plan before because God was taking too long. I have, and I'm going to tell you, it's not wise. And Abraham and Sarah get together. And, and I'm, I'm, so this one of those things, I just, I cannot figure these two out. Like, what are you thinking? And they say, well, you know, Sarah can't get pregnant. And Sarah says, here, I've got my maid. Her name is Hagar. Abraham, why don't you take Hagar into your tent, do your business, and give us a child. Ladies and gentlemen, how stupid do you have to be? That is one of, I mean, I, I, we don't, have, I, mean, I understand there's a difference between Hebrew culture and American culture, but we Americans are the ones that are kind of known as the ones being a little bit pleasure minded and maybe we like to, we like excess and we like big stuff and lots of, I, 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 this is messed up. And, can, and then what happens afterward, that they, I don't know why they didn't see this coming, but all of a sudden, Hagar has a child, Sarah doesn't have a child, and now there's strife between Hagar and Sarah. Now Abraham like, can't get no peace. He tries to go for home for dinner, and all he hears is, bah, 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 bah. Hagar this, and Hagar that, and Ishmael this, and Ishmael that. There is no peace on his home. Twenty years let go by, or so many years, no, about twelve years go by. Finally, Sarah gets pregnant. It's a supernatural conception. It's a wonderful thing. Isaac comes, and now Ishmael and Isaac are fighting. You got H you got Hagar and Sarah mean to each other, and and you know, look, you know, you know how it is, man. Sarah's with Abraham. She's got his attention, and he's just he's worked hard all day, and she's like. You got to do something. You can't let this go on. You can't let her treat me like this. You can't let Ishmael do this. You can't, you can't, you got to do something. And every day, Abraham's thinking like, what do you want me to do? You, this was your idea. <laughs> you got to do something. And every day. And now... Isaac gets a little older. Ishmael's going after Isaac, you know, kicking him, hitting him, stealing his toys, stealing his food, doing bad stuff and blaming it on him. And now the mom, y'all ever see, I know this doesn't happen in Cloverdale. This is an Ohio thing. But like, you know, you got family, sisters, siblings. And they all have kids now, and they come together for dinner. And one set of kids is mean to the other set of kids. And now we got siblings going at it. Like, your kid did this to my kid. Well, no, your kid started it. And now you got the adults arguing over something because one kid spilled another kid's milk and blamed it on another kid. Does anybody, does that happen in Indiana? Or that doesn't know how thing. Well, bless God, we can't, we can't, we can't, you know. Oh, Lord, Thanksgiving, they're going to bring their kids. Oh, my goodness gracious, they're going to bring them. We, 
We literally have this going on in the book of Genesis. This is, this is literally what's happening to a very high degree in Abraham. And then, I mean, finally, Sarah nagging gets so bad. And, 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 and ladies, I'm not telling you you should do this. Okay, don't do it. But finally, Abraham has to go to God. God, what do you want me to do? I cannot take it anymore. I'm not going to another dinner at my table like that. I can't take it anymore. Someone asked me today, I said, I said, I said, I said Pastor, I haven't seen you on the softball diamond yet. I said, and you're not going to. <laughs> they said, why? I said, I just got done coaching basketball after coaching softball. That is all the estrogen I need for a very long time. <laughs> Abraham's like, God, would it come? Abraham has to take his son, Ishmael, and Hagar. Now, we're not leaving them at an oasis. We're not leaving them at the, you know, we're not leaving them in town. We're not leaving them in, with their family. We're leaving them in the middle of a desert. Here's a water bottle, here's a loaf of bread. Love you, mean it, don't die, bye. You thought you had family problems. You know, listen, you, you know, the, the scriptures are so wonderful, though. You know, in the, in the book of Genesis, we see everything from blended families. We, 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 see, we see every type of issue that we can face in the book of Genesis and we see somehow these people emerge from being ugly ducklings and making the great hall of faith. Sarah, the whole Hagar thing was her idea. Ladies, that was stupid, just so you know. She laughed at God when God said, hey, this is going to happen. She laughed. She had no faith. She lied to God's face. God said, Sarah, I heard you laugh. She said, I wasn't laughing. <laughs> I'm not hungry. Whoa. Yeah, right. Moses. We all like Moses. What an awesome man of God he was. I mean, the whole the Ten Commandments, leading the people, sending up to Pharaoh. Well, I mean, he made the great hall of faith. He was awesome. I mean, I, when I go to heaven, he, all these, I want to meet these people. I want to have lunch with these people. I want to have dinner with these people. I really do. I think these people are awesome. Moses, one of the greatest heroes of the Bible, was a murderer. Now, I'm not giving you an excuse, okay? I know maybe your neighbor's dog pooped on your grass this past week, but it's not worth it. God comes to Moses and says, Moses, I need you to go for me. And instead of being the great hall of faith, Moses, Moses becomes the great excuse maker. Five times he says, God, I can't do it. He says, number one, he says, who am I that you should send me? Number two, he says, who shall I say sent me? Number three, he says, they won't listen to me. Number four, I don't speak eloquently. And number five, please send somebody else. God is saying, Moses, I'm calling you. And five times Moses says, no. How many ought to... I mean, I don't want to bring anything up that might trigger anybody, but, but Green Eggs and Ham is one of the best evangelistic books ever written. I'm not going to eat Greg, Green Eggs and Ham. I won't eat them with a the house. I won't eat them with a the mouse. I won't eat them in the car. I won't eat them here. I won't eat them there. I won't eat them anywhere. And what's the person say? Oh, but try them over here. I won't eat them with a the fox. I won't eat them with socks, whatever it is. I don't remember the book. But what, what, what happens is they're saying, no, I don't want green eggs and ham. And the other person says, you, want, you need to eat some green eggs and ham. I don't want green eggs and ham. Yes, you want green eggs and ham. I don't want them. I don't want them here. I don't want them there. I don't want them anywhere. But eat them here. Eat them there. Eat them anywhere. It'll be. And by the end of it, the, the person, the whatever it is, eats green eggs and ham and says, hey, I like green eggs and ham. You know what? That God is the ultimate salesperson. He's not going to give up on you. I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to do it. Will you do it here? Will you do it there? Will you do it anywhere? Will you do it with socks? Will you do it with a fox? But please do it. God doesn't give up on you. 
Moses told God no five times, and God came back again and said, yes. Has anybody ever tried to argue with God? Has anybody ever won? Uh, God was speaking directly to them. I mean, Moses was seeing, I mean, he's seen a sign. He's not seen a burning bush. His rod has been turned into a serpent at this point. His hand stretches out and turns into leprosy and then is healed again instantly. And God is showing, I mean, you talk, sometimes people say, God, give me a sign. God gave him a sign. He done did give him a sign. Those are some big signs. Burning bush, hand, leprosy, no leprosy. Throw down your stick. Snake, whoa. I think God might be talking to me. God, I don't want to do it. Oh, great man of faith. I've heard people say before, Moses had a temper problem. Not only did he murder somebody in anger, when he saw the Israelites not doing what they were supposed to do, he broke the Ten Commandments. I mean, he broke them all at once. <laughs> Dear Lord. Then later on down the road, Moses got so angry, God tells Moses to speak to the rock. He, does, he doesn't speak it. He just takes his stick and hits it. And Moses literally has a temper tantrum on a rock. Don't you all be looking at me so holy, because I know you done did the same thing. That's our champion. That's our champion. That's our great hall of faith. I mean, the list goes, I've got a long list. Rahab, one of the mothers of Jesus, she was a prostitute. Peter wrote two books in the New Testament, first and second Peter. One of the best friends of Jesus in Jesus' inner circle had the revelation that Jesus was the Christ, had the vision to take salvation to Gentiles. He was the one who preached on the day of Pentecost. I mean, he's an awesome man. But man, Peter was an ugly duck at times. He couldn't cast out a demon out of a little boy. He cut off the high, he, he's the one in the Garden of Eden who cut off the high priest's servant's ear. Ladies and gentlemen, that was stupid. I mean, Jesus had to, Jesus had to reach down and heal that ear. They were gonna, it was a death sentence for Peter. I mean, Peter, Peter still thought in, at, at that Garden of Gethsemane moment, he still did not get it at that time that Jesus had to go to the cross. He still thought that Jesus was going to raise up his earthly kingdom. They were kicking Rome out of Israel, and they were going to ruin reign forever from right there. And it was just so shocking when, the, when Jesus didn't do anything. He pulls out his sword out of anger and frustration and cuts that guy's ear off. That's bad. Has anybody here ever cut somebody's ear off? Anybody here ever murdered anybody? If you, say, if you have and the investigation is pending, do not comment. He denied Jesus three times that night, abandoned Jesus at his most difficult hour. That's one of our great heroes of faith. John refers to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. Nobody else called him that, but that's what he called himself. John had a little pride thing going on. I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. I think John, John was one of those guys who used teeth whitening strips. <laughs> Y'all remember when Carmen was here? I mean, dear Lord, talk about tooth whitening strips. I mean, when Carmen opened his mouth, it was like a flashlight, you know. I guess how John was. I'm John the Revelator. I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. As a matter of fact, if you read the, when you read the Gospel of John, it is amazing how many times John inserts something about himself in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the one in whom Jesus leaned his head on at the Last Supper. He says, he says I outran Peter when we were on our way to go see Jesus at the tomb. There, there's four or five things John says in, in the book of John to say, I'm better than everybody else. John was one of the ones, he came to Jesus and said, hey, Je right, right, where everybody could hear it. I mean, it wasn't, he wasn't even secretive, but, hey, Jesus, hey, me and my brother here, James, we think we're like, we've got the most stars on, by our names on the discipleship chart, and we think when you set up your kingdom, we want to sit on your right hand and your left hand. 
And the rest of the disciples are like, who does he think he is? And one time, there was somebody over there, they weren't acting right. And here comes Shiny Tooth John. He's a disciple that Jesus loved. He's called John the Beloved, but I don't think he started off as John the Beloved. He, said, he and his brother said, hey, Jesus, why don't we call fire down from heaven and just destroy all them people, huh? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of, man. You're the wrong spirit, boy. He was one of the ones who abandoned Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said, okay, guys, I need you to pray with me one hour. Sure, Jesus, I'll get that right after I take my little siesta. There's so many more. Elijah was suicidal and depressed. David committed adultery, premeditated murder, covered it up, took a census in direct violation of God's command. And yet God calls him one of the greatest kings of all Israel. Jacob was known as a deceiver and a liar, preying upon his own brother. Joseph was a big mouth bragger. All these people were in Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith. They were the beautiful swans, but they were some ugly ducks. And when I read about their lives... And I look at most of you, not counting Arlene. I think that our ugly duck moments have a ways to go before we can compete with those guys. Two things these guys had in common. Number one is scarlet cord. It's found in Joshua chapter 2, verse 18. Rahab. When the spies came to Rahab, she was a prostitute. She was, the way it's read, she was running a brothel. And when we think of brothel, we think of drugs. We think of sex trafficking. That's the type of lady this was. And the spies come to her, these Hebrew spies, and she shows kindness to them. She recognizes these are the men of God. These are the people of God. They have a covenant with God. And if I stay like I'm staying, I'm about to get dead. I'm going to make friends with these guys. I'm going to make covenant with these guys. I'm going to leave what I'm doing, and I'm going to become one of these Jewish people. And they said, here's the deal, Rahab, since you've been kind to us, since you want to be one of us, Take this scarlet cord and hang it in your window. And when we come upon Jericho to destroy it, everybody in your house shall be saved. There's a scarlet cord that goes from Genesis to Revelation. And every time we see a reference to blood, every time we see a reference to crimson, we see a reference to this scarlet cord. We're talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. And today, this is the church of the ugly duck. And there's a lot of works that are still in progress, but we have in common with Peter and John and Rahab and Elijah. We have in common. We've been covered by the blood of Jesus. And we don't stand here by our own merit. We stand here today by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that stands in place between us and the Father that we are righteous to go before him today. And number two... They were transformed. They didn't stay where they were. Sometimes that transformation took many years, like Abraham. We see Abraham's journey, and he makes a lot of mistakes. He's afraid. He does a few stupid things. But by the time it's all said and done, he has become the father of the faith. And truly, in Abraham, all the nations of the earth are being blessed today. Sometimes it was a dramatic event. Jacob had a night where he got so fed up with himself, he realized the error of his ways. He realized he was a liar and a deceiver. And the Bible tells us he had an encounter with God which kept him in a wrestling match all night and he was touched by God and he would never walk the same again. There was a dramatic event that changed his life. Peter and John... They were some boneheads. 
They had made so many mistakes. They did not understand half the teachings of Jesus. But on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there was the Holy Spirit given to them. And Peter, who just a few weeks ago was denying Jesus and cursing and walking away from his calling, now he's standing up in front of the thousands. And all of a sudden, Peter is becoming a theologian, and he's taking Old Testament scriptures, and he's saying, this is that which was prophesied by Joel, that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he begins to preach Jesus Christ, and 3,000 people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that day. You say, Pastor, man, I've fallen back. I've done this. I've done that. Welcome to the club. And God's not done with you. And maybe it'll be a transition over time. Maybe there's going to be an event. But I know this. My God shall complete in you what was started through Jesus Christ. I want to just give you a couple secular stories I just think are interesting. Like J.K. Rowling, I'm not, I'm not promoting her books, but she's basically a billionaire. She said, I had failed on an epic scale. I had an exceptionally short-lived marriage. I had imploded. I was jobless, a lone parent, and as poor as it possible to be in modern Britain, without being homeless. The fears that my parents had had for me and that I had had for myself had both come to pass, and by every usual standard, I was the biggest failure I knew. She's a billionaire. Bill Gates, and I'm not a Bill Gates fan, but he was a Harvard dropout. A business he started called Trafo Data went bankrupt. Billionaire. Albert Einstein could not speak fluently until the age of nine, a rebellious nature, and expelled from school. Abraham Lincoln, bankrupt business in 1831, a nervous breakdown in 1838, defeated in his run for president in 1856, 16th president of the United States, one of the greatest of all time. Walt Disney. Dropped out of school at a young age, failed an attempt to join the Army. One of his early ventures, Laugh-O-Gram Studios, went bankrupt because he didn't know how to run a business. He had a little job at a Missouri newspaper, and they fired him for saying he was not creative enough. Steven Spielberg rejected three times when he applied for USC, the School of Theater. He ended up going to the equivalent of a junior college. He now sits on the board of USC and gives them over a million dollars a year. General Douglas MacArthur uh, did not make it into West Point on his first attempt or his second. But on his third attempt, he made it into West Point, and the rest is in the history books. Dr. Seuss. Rejected by 27 publisher, the 28th publisher, Vanguard Press, sold 6 million copies of his first book. Today, over 100 million copies in print. Peter J. Daniels, one of the wealthiest men ever to walk the face of the earth. He's a born-again Christian. He's full of faith and power. His fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Phillips, constantly said, Peter J. Daniels, you're no good. You're a bad apple. You're never going to amount to anything. He was totally illiterate till the age of 26. Not only is he a billionaire, he's published many books, including one called Mrs. Phillips, You Were Wrong. <laughs> the movie Star Wars was rejected by every movie study, studio they presented it to multiple times, one of the highest grossing movies of all time. Herschel Walker, NFL running back in junior high school, wanted to play football. The coach told him he was too small. He advised young Herschel to go out for track instead. A few years later, Herschel Walker wins the Heisman Trophy. 
Henry Ford lost it all five times before the Ford Company. A Universal Pictures executive dismissed two young actors, saying, one, you have no talent. The other, you have a chip on your tooth, and Adam's apple sticks out too far, and you talk too slow. Burt Reynolds and Clint Eastwood. And lastly, a guy by the name of Sociero Honda desperately wanted to be a designer at Toyota. Toyota would not hire him. He felt like the biggest failure in the world. He went out and started a little company that makes automobiles today. In closing, <laughs> I, I, I don't, it's amazing when I walk into sometimes a situation and People have like these code words, you know, they don't mean to do it, but they just do it. Hey, everybody, Pastor Matt's here. Like, in other words, like, straighten up, clean up your language, no more dirty jokes, guys. That's what that means. I figured out the code. I've broken the code, guys. <laughs> Listen, we have our church face, but every one of us is an ugly duckling in the make. We're, we're the swan in the making. You failed. You've messed up. You, you, you got a great marriage, but you've had you've had. If, I mean, if you're married more than a year or two, you've had your fights. You've had your issues. If you've ever raised kids, you know there's no such thing as the perfect parent. The only perfect parent is when somebody who doesn't have kids say what they're going to be when they do have kids. <laughs> My goodness gracious! Bless God, when I have kids, I'm not going to let mine do that. Oh yeah. Be careful what you say. There's no second class Christians. There's no angels without wings. When you come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, when you accept that finished work on Calvary's cross, that is what makes you righteous, not what you've done wrong. Abraham made the hall of faith, not because he was so awesome, but because he was in covenant with God. David made the hall of faith, not because he was so awesome, but because he was in covenant with God. All the, these wonderful people of God, Sarah, Moses, Noah, they made the great hall of faith, not because they did everything right. They made it because they stayed in covenant with God, and they did not quit. I love what Jude verse 24 says. It says, to him who was able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. And you know what? We have this wonderful Holy Spirit spirit that's been poured out for us. We have the cross. We have Jesus. We have the word. And these things are all working. And if we'll stay with him, stay in covenant, stay, don't, uh, yeah, you're going to mess up. You're going to do goofy things. You're going to do stupid things. God made, God made the world and he looked at the world and said, oh my goodness, why did I give him a free will? Because we as human nature, I mean, we abuse our free will. But he looked at us with such great love. And he said, well, we can either do one of two things. Well, three things. We can do nothing. They'll destroy themselves. We can destroy them and speed up the process. Or we can save them. And they love you so much. While you were a sinner, Christ died for you. And so today... You might feel like an ugly duck, but Jesus sees you as a beautiful swan. It's that simple. You're not perfect. Maybe not even a conventional Christian. Maybe not overly religious. Maybe you don't wake up every day and, and dance around your bed and say, praise the Lord, 28 times. But here we are. And there's going to come a time when you are at the end. And you're going to be presented to God faultless. Not by your merit, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, 
since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run our race. And today I want you to know that in heaven is Noah, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Rahab. And they are cheering you on. And maybe you've struggled with this. And you have, maybe you're going through a marriage situation. And Abraham and Sarah are cheering on you on from heaven. And they're saying, hey, we made it. You can too. And maybe, maybe you've allowed yourself into an addiction. And you're trying to beat an addiction. And Rahab is saying, hey, you can do this. Maybe you've had a time where you've doubted or you've done this or you've done that. Jacob, Noah, Moses, maybe guys you had that temper and you lost your cool and Moses is up there and say, in heaven and he's saying, you know what? Keep on going, keep on going. You're going to make it. Don't quit. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. You may not be all you're going to be, but you're a lot better than you used to be. You haven't arrived, but you've left. I present to you the church of the ugly duck. God bless you. Let us pray. If you need prayer for a personal thing of any nature, you're welcome to come down here after our service. We'll have prayer partners lined up for you. If you would like to Ask Jesus into your heart. If you need prayer for a specific situation, these guys down here will be glad to meet with you and pray with you. If you say, Pastor, I've got these terrible things I've got to get rid of. We have a cool thing that meets on Friday night. It's called Celebrate Recovery. Be here at 630. Hurts, hangups, and habits. They can help you. Let's pray and be dismissed. Father, I bless these people. I thank you for your great grace upon this church. That even on the day, hearken, called daylight savings time unto thee, we have stayed awake and made it work. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us, for protecting us, Lord, for encouraging us today, for your joy in our hearts, and the peace of God that passes understanding, guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless.